Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, yeah, so my name is Henry Finn, and today I'm going to be presenting some initial insights on a research project that I'm currently working on, in which we've set out to answer a question that I think is hot on a lot of people's minds, and that is, how do people actually use our avalanche bulletins? Are they functioning in the way that they, they should be? And as I'm giving this talk, I'd like you to give some thought to this question that I have on the slide here about what type of bulletin user you think you are, about what parts of the bulletin you tend to pay most uh, attention to. So in spring of this year, uh, we conducted a series of interviews in the lower mainland of BC um, with the aim of trying to get a better handle on what different types of bulletin user there are out there. And while we don't have any uh, formal conclusive results at this, uh, this point, we've got some really interesting insights which I'm excited to share with you uh, in this talk. And before I get stuck in, I'd like to give a special thanks to my research partner, Anne St. Clair, as well as our supervisors, uh, Pascal Hagley, Robin Gregory, and Carl Klassen, for their continued support, commitment, and guidance in what's been a, a fascinating journey that we've embarked on together. So, as you're all very well aware, each day during the winter season, avalanche forecasters uh, provide the public with an overall assessment of the conditions for different forecasting regions. Uh, detailing the danger at different elevations and the types of problems that they should anticipate and account for in their trip planning strategies. We have a very similar system up in Canada, as do most of the forecasting services around the world. But one of the main challenges facing the people constructing these crucial risk communication messages is that they don't really have a clear picture of who it is that they're talking to or of how the information is being used and interpreted by those accessing it. So allow me to introduce uh, Keith and Delena. Uh, and I should stress that those are not their actual names. Uh, they t uh, took part in our interview. So if you know a Keith and Delena that are into backcountry touring, this isn't them. Um, <laughs> uh, but Keith is a 42-year-old uh, uh, backcountry skier with an advanced avalanche skills training course. And Delena is a 31-year-old snowshoer with no formal training. And currently, the way that we perceive uh, people like Keith and Delena and uh, the rest of the backcountry community is through these demographic descriptors, uh, like their activity, so whether or not they're uh, snowmobilers, uh, snowshoers, or, or backcountry skiers. Um, and I could change uh, the colors here to show instead um, their age category or their level of training. And how we perceive the backcountry community is, is really important because 90% of avalanche fatalities are recreationalists. And after tragic avalanche accidents involving people like Keith and Delena, we're often left grappling with questions about what could have been improved, how could things have been different, and how could mistakes have been prevented. And the truth is that in the avalanche forecasting industry, we spent a lot of time, years, behind closed doors, in the boardroom, thinking about the delivery end of our communications, about what the optimal structure and content should be of our bulletins. And no one has ever really asked the users what they think on the receiving end of those messages. And so this is where our research project comes in. The goal of our research is to get a better handle on how uh, recreationalists use our risk communication products with the aim of establishing opportunities to make those products uh, cater more closely to their needs. So earlier on this year, uh, we set out in the first phase of our study to um, conduct some interviews. And we knew it was going to be really challenging to obtain a diverse sample that didn't just have users like yourselves who are really uh, accomplished and keen enthusiasts. We wanted to get the whole range. Um, so after standing out on trailheads for long hours in the cold and hassling people uh, who just wanted to go touring and uh, infiltrating into an absurd number of Facebook groups, uh, I'm very excited to say that we, we did manage to obtain a, a diverse sample. So as you can see here, we had a considerable number of people who had no formal training. Um, we had a nice spread of different primary activity types. I realize that that's not visible to you. So I'm going to pause a bit longer on each of these graphs so you can take it in. Um, we had most of our users as very frequent bulletin visitors or bulletin users. But what was really exciting uh, was that we had a bunch of people who had either rarely seen the bulletin or never seen it before. Um, 
And finally, we had a really nice uh, range of different ages in a uh, sample of 42 people. So what types of things did we ask in the interviews? Um, and whilst I'm going through some of these examples of questions, again, perhaps you could think about some of the things that you might say in response to these questions. Um, but we had hour-long interviews. They were semi-structured interviews. And we had a script which facilitated conversation about planning process um, and about habits and routines. So we would start every interview by asking very open questions, like uh, what are the considerations you take into account when you're planning a trip? Um, we had lots of questions about information sources. So where do people go to get that information about avalanche conditions and about weather? Um, and what is it that they pay most attention to when they're looking at that information? Uh, we had a section of the script which explored the importance of the danger ratings to people. And we had uh, people say what sorts of conditions come to mind when they think of the word moderate, when they think of the word considerable, and when they think of the word high. And we had some fascinating discussion as well about the avalanche problems. Um, so uh, how do people perceive the problems? How do they use them? Do they find them confusing? Towards the end of the interviews, uh, we had some practical activities. Um, so we had an exercise with different photos of terrain uh, where people had to sort uh, these different photos into what they thought represented the different elevation bands. Um, and we had a really uh, cool activity with the Autovox SAM mountain model where we would show people a bulletin with specific conditions and then we would say, okay, can you take this red pen for me and can you show me on this mountain where do you think the problem areas are? Where should you be avoiding? Um, and that, again, brought up some really, really interesting insights and discussion. So to kind of present some of those sentiments that we heard and some of those thoughts, I'm going to bring uh, Keith and Delena back in as uh, sort of case studies. Um, so first of all, Delena was this brilliantly opinionated enthusiast. She had uh, lots of very telling things to say about her experiences using our products. Um, as I said earlier, she was a, a snowshoer. Um, she has 10 years of experience. She's actually just started uh, backcountry skiing this year and no formal training. And she was the type of person um, that would go out looking for information uh, that evaluated and analyzed the conditions for her so that she didn't have to make that assessment for herself. Um, and she definitely voiced a sentiment which we heard quite commonly in which people said that the bulletin was just too technical. There were far too many of these jargon terms. I don't know what this means. Convex rolls, one thing. It doesn't mean anything to me and it doesn't lay it out in layman's terms. Um, which is, yeah, quite striking to, to hear. Um, we had a really uh, interesting conversation with Delena about her perception of the danger rating. She made it very clear that she didn't think there should be a five-point uh, danger scale. Um, and she uh, voiced this desire to have a tool which enabled her to make go or, or no-go decisions. So I'm going to read this quote just because it's so brilliant. I wonder why there needs to be that distinction between those two levels of the high. Uh, whether it should just be combined into one and say, like, you probably shouldn't be going out after it goes above the moderate. Um, and she also spoke about the kind of ambiguity and her confusion over what each of the different terms was telling her to do. So she actually said, I always think considerable is higher than high. Um, again, she spoke of this, um, this phenomenon which we heard from a number of different interview participants, which is how they would drastically change their behavior depending on who they were traveling with. Um, so Delena would often go out snowshoeing by herself but if she was traveling with a, a, a mentor, a, a meaningful mentor, um, she would almost completely defer decision-making responsibility away from herself. She has an AST, she has the awareness, I don't have any training, so she makes the decisions and I just follow along. So it's really interesting to see that for one person you could have almost completely different behavioral routines. And then uh, the last thing about Delena that I want to bring forward was this um, very common desire that people, to have, that people had, which was to have more of an educational component incorporated into the bulletin. People were asking for quizzes, uh, more definitions, maybe interactive glossaries for those terms that they, that they didn't understand, maybe even a trip planning game of some sort, which gave them instant feedback on, on their knowledge and helped them to understand what they uh, didn't understand. <laughs> um, 
So moving on to Keith, um, he had also a lot, a lot of experience, um, but he definitely used the bulletin in, in a different way. Um, we interviewed him up in Whistler, which is where he'd been skiing for just under uh, 20 years, and he planned most of his backcountry trips uh, with his 13-year-old son and his wife. And he just had a very uh, well-rounded together understanding of all the different parts of the bulletin, um, of what they were for and how to apply the information. Um, and so when we asked Keith about his, his, uh, his planning routines, he spoke of this constant iterative process in which he and his peers would come together to uh, discuss the information sources that they'd looked at for the avalanche and the weather conditions. Um, and then based on those, the, the kind of comparison of those different sources, they'd make that uh, decision about uh, their terrain and their destination. Uh, when we asked Keith about what he looks for to stay safe when he's out there, um, he spoke of this really impressive communication dynamic that he has in his groups, where they're constantly looking at things, questioning them, asking each other questions, and uh, looking for sort of visual cues and, and, and uh, significant sudden changes in the temperature and the snowpack. Uh, we had a great conversation with Keith about the avalanche problems, um, and he spoke extensively about his knowledge of the different types of problems um, and which ones were more scary to him and the different types of uh, mitigation and management techniques that he and his, his groups would use to uh, make sure they didn't get caught in each of those different types of, of problem. Um, and then finally, um, again, Keith brought forward uh, this sentiment which we had from lots of people, which was um, they just, the novelty of being given a bulletin and then right there and then uh, having to apply that information, that knowledge to terrain was something that people really took so well to, so much so that when we finished the SAM activity, Keith got really sad and asked if he could take the SAM home with him. Um, but that was really striking and again I think speaks to that um, desire to have more educational tools incorporated into the bulletin. So where does all this leave us? Um, well, we're going to use this incredibly rich data set that we've collected to create a classification system. And not one that groups people by their age or their activity or by their level of experience, but instead classifies users based on their depth of bulletin use and comprehension. The really interesting question that comes next is, well, who makes up these different groups? What characteristics and factors help to define those different categories and what pieces of information are most useful to each group? So in this upcoming winter, we're going to be conducting a large-scale online survey to try and see what the wider distribution of these different use patterns is. Um, and if we continue to see these recurring patterns across the wider population, then perhaps our eventual aim might be to produce separate avalanche forecasting products that specifically cater to each of the separate needs of those different user groups, which is exciting. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to finish off um, by saying I hope you all have a fantastic season. I hope you're all as excited as I am. And who knows, maybe in a few seasons down the line, you'll be using a forecasting product that caters specifically to your needs and objectives and those of your classification group. Uh, yeah, I'd like to give a special thanks to all of our supporters who um, really make this research possible. Um, and before I go to questions, I would like you all, if you're interested in partaking in our survey, if you could uh, either note down this link or um, maybe uh, put it in your phone browser. Um, this would be a place that you can enter your contact information, or yeah, just take a photo is probably much easier. Um, yeah, if, if you could enter your contact information, we'll be sending out um, more info as, as time goes by. And, and also, if you could spread the link to people who you think might be less likely to access it, that would really help us to get that diverse sample again that we would love for the, for the survey to make it meaningful and worthwhile. Um, so thanks very much for listening. Thank you for having me here today. It's a real pleasure and a privilege. Um, yeah, thanks.